presents um, a talk on formulating optimal policies using behavioral models. Um, so Flavio, please do go ahead. Let me just unmute. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So this uh, was actually a very nice, uh, uh, we were kind of in luck because um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, in some sense overlaps a bit with uh, with the the issues that um, that Eli uh, brought up. Now, I, I thought long and hard about how to, to structure this talk. Uh, and I decided rather than to talk about a specific research project, I thought it was to be useful because I'm talking to non-economists mainly to try to tease out whether the general principles that are adopted in our approach to disease modeling. So I'm going to try to kind of uh, distill what I think are the, the main messages. And I'm going to give you an example of how these are applied to optimal policy um, design, but really is, is a very simple, very toy model. So what I want you to take away from that is really just the general principles. And then you can substitute in uh, your favorite model afterwards, if you really want to uh, take this uh, kind of analysis further. So let me, uh, so the, the way I thought it would be useful, let me first set, set the stage by, by putting a quote here. This is two weeks ago, a uh, quote by uh, Graham Medley, chair of, uh, of SPY-M, who says the critical problem for decision-making is that the future is unpredictable. Models cannot predict numbers accurately. And this is mostly because of behavior that is often completely unpredictable. So, uh, so I, of course, and many other people will take issue with this being completely unpredictable. Uh, we do think we know a little bit about what people's uh, motivations are, even though we might not be able to uh, perfectly predict it. And here, uh, there's a, a tweet by a former, I think he was a US congressman, who also says that, of course, epidemiologists cannot know the specific actions of each individual. Uh, this is not knowable to any scientists. Uh, having said that, of course, we do have some tools of analysis to start making progress in trying to understand what are the uh, critical trade-offs and what are the things that are likely to work and in, in which fashion. So I thought actually in order to, to, to explain what is the economic, uh, you know, the, the, the methodology of economics, I thought it was useful to do it along the headlines of the three sessions of this, uh, of this conference. So the first one, of course, is understanding behaviors. What we're really after is, is what are the things that drive behavior and how can we model those things? Uh, we've seen very nice examples uh, earlier on in, in this uh, in this um, in this workshop of, of of how you can model individual behavior. Uh, the the approach that we take uh, and it's not completely different from the ones that we've seen already in different several presentations is to use some kind of decision theory uh, in, in case that there's no uncertainty and in case there is uncertainty the extension of decision theory uh, to choice under uncertainty. So these are principles that most economists will have seen in one context, context or other, either in demand theory or in investment theory or what have you. Um, and so, so this is going to be uh, kind of one of the building blocks of the uh, economic approach to, uh, to disease modeling. The second thing we were interested in is how do we integrate behavior into uh, epidemic models? So what we really want to know is how can we, how can we use these beautiful dynamic models that the, that, that the SPY-M and, and people like them are using to try to understand the, uh, the epidemic, how can we integrate the kind of, of decision-making we've, uh, we've developed in the first bullet point? How can we uh, in, in, you know, directly put them into the model itself, okay? Rather than looking at behavior as an afterthought that may change parameters, okay? And so the way we're gonna do it is by building a coupled behavioral epidemiological system. So it's going to be a model pretty much like the ones that, that the, SPY, the SPY-M and other models are used to, to dealing with, but with, with a caveat, which is that the, the behavior in this model through the, uh, the decision theory model that we've done in the first bullet point is going to modify the force of infection. So we are going to basically embed the decision problem into the uh, epidemic model, and that will uh, allow us to, to see how different interventions change behavior, and hence now how those interventions indirectly through behavior will influence the aggregate dynamics, okay? And the last thing, which is the, 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 the topic, of course, of today, is uh, using these models to inform policy. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to say, well, how we have now you know, built this uh, coupled behavioral epidemiological system 
uh, we understand maybe a little bit more about what are the trade-offs and how we expect people to behave, how can we use that to, to actually inform um, policy making? Uh, and the literature has taken two different approaches uh, and uh, they won't be surprises. The first one is to basically use the methodology of optimal control theory, uh, which is basically uh, one of many different tools for dynamic optimization. Uh, we can use that kind of, 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 um, of a methodology to, to, uh, to create what we call the first best outcome, which is basically to characterize in an ideal world where everybody does what they're told, what are the achievable outcomes? So this, of course, is an idealized goal that is difficult to uh, actually achieve. But once we know that, we may be able to contrast what is our, our first best solution with what actually happened in equilibrium. And then we can start thinking about modifying people's behavior through subsidies or taxes or other interventions in order to achieve uh, those greater outcomes. And an alternative way of doing it is to do what we call second best analysis, which is to say, we are not necessarily going to look for the best possible policy. We are going to uh, just look at uh, ad hoc interventions, and then we're going to compare the welfare properties of these different interventions and see whether uh, these are better than, say, doing nothing. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the three-step procedure we're going to be using. Now, underlying all this uh, is uh, what, what is called in economics the neoclassical synthesis, and it has become one of the central uh, ideas in post-World War II economics. And the idea of the neoclassical synthesis uh, really came out of macroeconomics. Uh, before this uh, new research program was kind of solidified, uh, there was a dichotomy between, on the one hand, macroeconomic research that looked at aggregate relationships between variables, and on the other hand, microeconomics, which informed uh, individual decision-making by, for example, consumers, or families, households, uh, or firms. And what the neoclassical synthesis said basically is that in order to understand aggregate dynamics in, in the population or in the economy or, or what have you, what we need to do is we have to understand the underlying mechanisms and behavior, and in some sense, build up the model from the ground up. So this is what is known in economics as, as making, uh, creating micro foundations. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from the micro level. We're going to look at individuals, uh, people in, 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 our, in our case. They're going to live in a, in, a pop, in a population where there's an infectious disease. What we're going to do is we're going to look at how people respond to, uh, to the spread of the disease. And then we're going to scale up. We're going to aggregate across people. Uh, and then we're going to use that to uh, inform uh, our, our thinking about aggregate dynamics. Okay. So let me just show you a, a, little, a little graph here. So what we have here at the upper level, we can think of that as the macroscopic level. So for an economist, this would be the macroeconomy, but of course, this is going to be a disease model. So you can think of aggregate dynamics like the SIR model or the SEIRS model, or pick your favorite compartmental model uh, that's going to be up here. Now, traditionally, uh, uh, before kind of equilibrium analysis became really used in this literature, uh, there were people looking at, uh, you know, how do we influence directly the aggregate um, uh, disease dynamics through, for example, uh, control measures and so forth. Now, what, what the new approach using the, the, uh, the neoclassical synthesis is doing is basically we're going to look at individual decision making at the microscopic level. We're going to then aggregate those and those are going to inform uh, the, uh, the aggregate dynamics, okay? Uh, so what individuals do is going to influence incidence and prevalence, because if people stay at home, for example, they're not going to uh, infect their co-workers and so forth. So individual and micro level decisions are going to influence in, uh, incidence and prevalence, which of course is going to influence the aggregate dynamics. But because people make decisions based on individual trade-offs, those aggregate dynamics are also going to influence those trade-offs and hence influence individual decisions. And the policy levers at our disposal, for example, stay at home orders and so forth, are going to influence this interaction or this loop through individual trade-offs. So for example, if, if you want to introduce statutory sick pay, that is going to in influence these trade-offs and they have thereby indirectly change disease dynamics through individual level decisions, okay? So the, the real message here, and this is just to echo what, what uh, Eli said in his talk, 
is that the micro influences the macro and the macro, of course, influences also individual behavior. In addition, I just want to point out two things that this framework allows us to do. First of all, it allows us to study explicitly intertemporal feedback. So that is what people, what you and everyone else does today influences the, uh, the course of the epidemic going forward, but that also is going to change your behavior tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So they are going to be very complicated into temporal feedback loops. And the last thing I just want to point out is that, uh, of course, we are also going to have uh, the possibility of interactive behavior. That is the possibility that my decision in, make, in, in choosing, for example, whether or not to vaccinate will depend in general about on, on whether other people in the population uh, will, will vaccinate themselves. So this kind of interactive behavior uh, will, will something we can actually study because in our model, we actually have an equilibrium analysis of people's decision-making, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you the toy model. We're going to start uh, from, from something that, that we're all familiar with by now. This is just the, the, this is the number of infected people in a standard SIR model. And there's not much uh, action here other than to see that this is the usual peak. So this is the no behavior standard model, okay? Uh, and uh, this, of course, is not a, a very good description of, of, of actual decision making because there is no decision making. This is just a mechanistic model. Uh, and as our uh, friend Ferguson pointed out in 2007, most basic models assume that parameters are static. But in fact, people's responses often shifts uh, as the epidemic progresses. And, you know, people are likely to protect themselves more when things look grim than when things look better. So this is the kind of thing we want to capture in a model. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a model of so we're going to look at a single individual uh, in a large population. And I'm not going to spend much time on this just to show that this is just one example of how you can build that kind of model. So this is a, a fairly complicated uh, problem in the sense that in this particular formulation, I allow individuals to be forward looking and to do into temporal maximization and so forth. So this is the maximization problem. These equations down here are basically equations that keep track of the probability that an individual is either susceptible, infected and recovered. And therefore uh, these probabilities keep track of whether the individual will put in higher effort or lower effort uh, to protect themselves. Um, the important thing to note here is the last bullet point, which is that uh, in these last pop large population games or models we're looking at, we assume that aggregate dynamics are not influenced by the decisions of a single individual. Only when you aggregate up across individuals uh, do they have an impact. So the idea is, for example, when you decide whether or not to take a face mask on, you don't behave as if your decision actually matters on aggregate. You don't individually change the course of the epidemic, even though you might, of course, be able to do so uh, in your household. Okay, so this is a fairly complicated uh, you know, setup because people are forward looking and so on, but you can have much, much simpler decisions where people are myopic and they're just responding to risk in each period without looking ahead. And that will give you pretty much similar dynamics, even though the, uh, some of the features will change. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, that is not a distinction that is important. So what does that model give us relative to the no behavior, uh, um, no behavior uh, dynamics? Well they give us exactly what we were after, which is basically that uh, early on in the epidemic, there's very little infection. And so people are not going to respond very much. You know, if there's one person who's infected in the Isle of Man, then people in Oxford are not going to, you know, change their behavior very much. But if suddenly people are in Cambridge and a market square suddenly uh, uh, become very infected or lots of people become infected, people are going to start changing their behavior. And over time, of course, it's going to lead to more and more social distancing, and that's going to modify the uh, extent of infection in this model, okay? Now, uh, what about a social planner? Suppose that you were a social planner um, and you were interested in, in deciding what is the best thing you could achieve. Well, then we can write up a, a social planner's problem. Uh, this is different from the one of the individual because in this formulation, uh, the overall welfare of the society is taken into account rather than just of a single individual. And here we have our standard uh, SIR dynamic system, 
but with the difference is that the beta, which or beta I, which is the force of infection, is now moderated by the extent of social distancing, which or lockdowns, which I've called D here. So when D is zero, then we are back in the purely biological model with no social distancing. When D is close to one, then we are basically shutting down the whole population and there are no further infections. Okay. So this kind of uh, dynamics uh, give rise to this, um, or rather this decision problem give rise to, uh, to, to this picture. And as you can see, um, the optimal level of social distancing and, and consequently the optimal level of, of infection is going to be different. Uh, so we're going to have more social distancing uh, in, in, the, in the optimal solution and therefore less infection. So why is that? So why is it that, so the first thing to point out is that voluntary behavior is already got, going to give us a little bit of bang for the buck. It's going to make things better than in, if people don't respond to it. But of course, a social planner might want to have even more lockdowns. And the reason is, is a well-known one uh, that, uh, and it's easy to, uh, to appreciate, which is the, the fact that there are uninternalized externalities. And so when I protect myself, I may not factor in that uh, my decisions also spill over on the well-being of other people. Uh, and I might, you know, I might care about my, my, my immediate family. I might, even if I'm a, if I'm a very nice person, I might even care about their friends and maybe my colleagues. But do I care about my colleagues, fish, fishmongers, ha hairdressers, uh, you know, uh, cart, cart partner and so on. You can see that, you know, even, even, even well-intentioned people might really not take every single step uh, into account or rather every single possible person that they might um, infect in the future. So there is a role for public policy or a public policy intervention. And those in principle can take two forms, okay? The details may differ, but the overall there are two different versions of interventions. One of them uh, is, uh, is to modify the incentives of people. So to basically work directly on their trade-offs and mathematically that means through the payoff functions in, uh, in this model. And that can happen through a number of different ways. Um, it can either be, for example, statutory sick pay, furlough schemes, uh, payment for self-isolation, so on and so forth. So these are basically, these are basically policies that you put in place that don't directly restrict people's choices. But what they do do is that they make some of those choices more privately um, uh, attractive for people than say other behaviors. So this is your classical, for example, subsidizing vaccines or subsidizing condom use or, or some such thing. And the alternative uh, we can do is to directly restrict what people are able to do. And of course, we've seen many of those examples uh, over the last year, uh, which is, for example, lockdown, school closures, stay in, play orders, uh, stay, stay in place or, uh, orders, and so forth. So, so those are two different conceptually, two different sets of tools. And uh, of course, in practice, we've seen both of those being uh, deployed, um, both uh, the ones that modify incentives and the ones that are kind of more brute force, which is to uh, actually change people's uh, behavior directly through restrictions on their physical ability to do the wrong thing, quote unquote. Okay. Uh, I, I should say that in principle, uh, incentives can be provided fairly effectively were it not for, this, for, the, for the fact that people are heterogeneous and, and usually know more about themselves than you uh, would know as a social planner. So designing these kind of incentive schemes may actually be uh, a difficult thing to achieve, okay? So let me now give you an example of, um, of the kind of policies one can do. So this is uh, based on a, on a recent paper, working paper that I've done with Miltos Macris. Uh, and this is just uh, an example of uh, how we can do a policy in this. So the first one, the first, you know, uh, we can do is that uh, we can we can do subsidies and and uh, and the lockdown. So this is one kind of policy. But what we're going to do now is what I call a second best policy, which is to look at what happens if we have a vaccine coming on the horizon, and we want to figure out how do we phase in, uh, you know, the 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 post vaccine era. So that's kind of the question we we ask in this question. So suppose that at a at a predetermined future date, a, a perfect vaccine will become uh, available. And so it's announced in advance and we want to figure out how does that, uh, you know, the, the arrival of this vaccine, how does that change uh, the pre-vaccine behavior of the population? Uh, 
Okay, and one thing to note here is that um, a vaccine is really only very interesting if, if you can benefit from it. And so who are the ones who stand most to benefit from a vaccine? Those are the people who are uh, not yet infected uh, or have not been infected and therefore have a reduced um, susceptibility, okay? Um, and so what that means is that as, as the date of the vaccine approaches, it becomes increasingly valuable to stay healthy because you can actually benefit from that uh, vaccine. I like to, when I explain this to, to people, I like to think of this in terms of a lottery ticket. Uh, the closer you get to the vaccination date, the closer is the lottery ticket to pay off. Uh, but that also means that you are willing to pay more for that ticket. And payment in this world is basically staying healthy uh, through costly self-protective measures. So what that gives us is something like this. Let me just, let's focus on the lower panel. So the lower panel shows you three different graphs um, or curves. The, the, the black curve is equilibrium social distancing behavior across the epidemic in a world in which the vaccine only arrives at date 120. So that's basically saying the vaccine arrives, but by the, by the time that most of the population has already been through uh, this epidemic and it's kind of too late. Okay? So that's going to be our benchmark. And with that, we can, for example, compare the blue path, which is a path when, in fact, when the vaccine arrives at date 60. And one thing that is noteworthy here is that uh, people ramp up their self-protective behavior just before the arrival of the vaccine. And the reason they do that in this model is that as, as the date of vaccination becomes closer and closer to them, that it becomes more and more imperative to stay healthy. And so the day before you get your jab, you really want to be careful because otherwise you're going to lose out on this opportunity uh, to get vaccinated, okay? So that's the equilibrium one. We can then look at, the, at the, what the social planner would do in the same, in the same world. And you can see that there are quite, uh, quite important differences. But because uh, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend too much time on that other than to say we, have, we are now in the process of extending this analysis to stage rollouts where you have multiple stages of, ro of, uh, of vaccine rollout. We are also going to be looking at um, imperfect vaccine protection and, um, and also with the possibility of waning immunity. But this is just to give you to whet your appetite for the kind of things one can do uh, in this kind of framework. Let me uh, end by, by just showing you two, three or more slides on the pitfalls of not looking at, um, at the both behavior and interaction. So, so if you ignore incentives, strange things can happen. So this is an example here. I found this on the internet recently. Uh, these were current estimates. I forget uh, who I, I actually tweeted this out if somebody's interested in the, in the reference. This is basically telling us uh, um, the, the, the current estimates of vaccine efficacy. Uh, and the first one here is prevent, preventing infection minus 9.5%. And then there's an ex a useful explanatory note a negative effect here means that vaccines increase risk. Of course, in a non-behavioral world, if you had a, a vaccine that increased your risk of, of becoming infected, that wouldn't be a very nice uh, intervention at all. Uh, and so the way to, to explain that, of course, is that uh, people who are vaccinated may expose themselves uh, to more contacts because, um, uh, because they think they are perfectly protected, but in fact, they aren't. Uh, and this is not just one study. Uh, there was a study from Public Health England and also similarly from Israel showing that uh, elderly people who had been uh, vaccinated had an increase, a notable rise in COVID-19 infections subsequently, but just a few days after, uh, possibly because they thought they were safe because they had been vaccinated, but in fact, the full protection hadn't kicked in yet. And so they were maybe under false uh, false uh, impression that they were completely protected. But really the point to make here is that the fact that they changed their behavior uh, based on their idea of, 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 or their belief in being actually protected is really uh, the interesting part here that people change behavior when they think uh, their trade-offs have changed, okay? And the last thing, and the, by the way, and this is a, a, something that uh, um, Eli also referred to uh, as a risk compensation, uh, or you can also know, uh, call it a disinhibition. And this is, of course, uh, an odd thing that a rational or a decision-making model can easily uh, explain. Now, the last thing I want to just point out uh, is the possibility that interaction in the population can actually uh, create odd things on the aggregate. 
Okay, so uh, strategic behavior. I, what, what do I mean by strategic behavior? Uh, strategic behavior simply means that your decision will be conditional on what other people do in the population. So this is all that means, okay? Uh, and so there are two canonical cases that, that economists work with uh, called strategic substitutes and strategic complements. So let me just give you one example of each. Uh, the first one is, is what we call strategic substitutes. Uh, sometimes it's privately optimal not to do what others are doing. And the example of that, that of course we're all battling with right now, is uh, the possibility of herd immunity through vaccination. So uh, if, uh, if, for example, I only care about my own well-being, well, then what happens is that the more other people in the population get vaccinated, the better protection I get as an individual through, uh, indi uh, through indirect protection through herd immunity, okay? But that basically tells us that when other people do more of it, you want to do less of it, okay, on the margin. So that you can think of it as a as a avoid the crowd incentives where you want to do the opposite of what the crowd does. Okay. Now uh, the other the other, the opposite can also happen. Sometimes it's optimal to do what others do. So to follow the crowd. But let me give you an example of that, which is head lice in a nursery. So think of think of the following of following setup. Your child has head lice. You're deciding whether or not to uh, to uh, to to um, to cure your child of head lice and, and clean them off. But you also know that tomorrow your child is going to go back to the nursery and may be reinfected uh, by, from other children. And so what you realize is that, uh, th that you're in some sense playing a game against other parents. If everyone cleans their children's uh, hair and, and, and gets rid of the lice, then everybody will be safe uh, from, from reinfection tomorrow. Whereas if, if nobody does, then you won't do, do, do so either, right? Uh, there's no point in, in getting rid of the lice today if they're going to be reinfected very, very high probability next morning, okay? And so you can see that here, people have incentives to actually uh, do the same thing as other people. And so uh, these different kinds of interaction, they will lead to different aggregate uh, behavior. And these might actually have important policy implications. And let me just tell you what those policy implications is in a very stylized way. So in the case of, um, uh, in the first case, for example, when you don't wanna do what others do, then what you can have is you can have crowding out effects. For example, suppose you're subsidizing one part of the population to get uh, immunized. Well, then you can make it even less attractive for the other part of the population to get immunized. Okay, so basically uh, you're trying to do good in one dimension, but it actually makes your problem difficult in another dimension. Okay, now in the other case where everybody really wants to do the right thing, but only do so when other people do it as well. Well, there, there's a strong case for public uh, intervention in terms of coordination of expectations and decisions. So there uh, we might actually be able to get a lot of bang for the buck with very little outlay, simply by coordinating people's behavior and then build on the fact that people want intrinsically to do the same thing as other people are doing, okay? So I'm going to skip that and just, just advertise that uh, if you're interested in, in more like this, uh, I, have a, a, I have a dedicated website where I collect my work on economic epidemiology. Uh, there is both research papers, but there is also kind of more general interest pieces where I take up uh, a lot of these different issues in, in economic uh, epidemiology and, uh, and also uh, I tweet regularly about these issues. So, um, so yeah, that's the, that's the way to, uh, to follow my, uh, my work in, uh, in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavio, that was excellent. Um, does anyone have any questions for Flavio? I think, um, was it Samuel left a comment on one of, for one of your slides um, that said, not even if the single individual is the head of state. So I think that was in reference to people not wearing masks. Um, yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know where that, that's not even a single individual. I don't know what that is a re reference to. Sam, would you like- Yeah, that's to, right. <laughs> would, Sam, would you like to ask that question again in context? I don't know if Sam's still on the call actually. Okay, no, that's all right. I think I think it was more of a comment rather than. Oh, okay. I think it was fine. like wanted equation, like your first yeah. equation slide. There was, you had the statement that, um, 
aggregate behavior is not influenced by a single individual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, tr that's trivially true if you have only one individual making decisions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So somebody... Um, great. Yeah, someone's asked a question. So um, I am a health economist, not mathematical modeler. May I ask your advice that how yeah. would you think if it's possible to combine the behavioral model with discrete choice model thank so you so this is this is a great this is a great uh, question so uh, so these models i mean let me just caveat that by saying that i i'm a, i'm a theorist in the sense that i'm interested in these kind of broader relationships i don't I rarely take my my models directly to the data but there are many many people that do exactly that uh, in all sorts of different contexts, for example, you know, labor supply or uh, marriage choice or investment policy and so on, and they get into the nitty gritty, what, what are the right functional form, form assumptions and so on. And this is exactly where something like uh, these discrete choice models uh, come to their right. So yes, uh, I, I don't personally work with this kind of models, but this is exactly the right way to go. Um, so yes, can you explain how behavioral equations can be parameterized? So this is exactly, uh, well, I'm basically, uh, I will have to just repeat that, that same thing. So, um, so often people, they, they build very flexible models uh, based on some kind of, of, of choice of decision theory, and then they, they can go to data. The, you know, there are many different ways to do it. You can look at aggregate relationships and look at aggregate data. If you're just interested in, um, in, in, in a particular individual, one way you can do it is to look at, um, at experiments. I did that some years ago with a graduate student where we had a, uh, a decision problem where people didn't know their own health status. And so what we did is we basically did ran a, a bunch of experiments, computer experiments with students so as to try to, uh, to, to understand whether the kind of a decision theory we had built, whether it had any bite in reality. And actually we found uh, quite nice uh, correspondence uh, between, uh, or rather, uh, correspondence between the experimental data and the um, and the and the model. Yeah. Uh, hey, we tried to find discrete choice. Oh, so this is just a reference to the yeah. to the previous question. Okay, that's not a question yeah. from then. Are there any more questions um, for Flavio? There's In any no case, hands I'm I'm going to be here to the yep. to the very end. So yeah, that's so. perfect. Um, so thank you, Flavio, and thank you for your questions, everyone. Um, so it is break time.